Um, so we're going to talk about uh, part of the anchor experience. Ashish Beatty introduced the study group yesterday, so you're a little bit familiar with that. I'd first like to acknowledge my co-authors, Eduardo Novais and Jeff Neppel, who did the majority of the work, and then the anchor study group, many of whom are here uh, at the meeting. These are my disclosures, not related to this uh, publication or to this presentation. So as we all know, the treatment of symptomatic acetabular dysplasia continues to evolve over time. Acetabular reorientation is now a standard part of that treatment. At the same time, the use of hip arthroscopy has increased over time for various hip disorders. So now a common question we've ha we have is, what is the role of hip arthroscopy in the treatment of symptomatic acetabular dysplasia? So the treatment options could be viewed as, as the following. So acetabular reorientation alone certainly is a well-accepted treatment for acetabular dysplasia. A reorientation with arthroscopy could have some benefits in a case like this where we, we have a very unstable large labral detachment. And then arthroscopy alone really is the most controversial option and whether there is a role for that and if so, in what type of patient. So if you look at the literature, uh, the results really are variable. I think a, a fair conclusion from the literature is that there's a heightened risk of suboptimal clinical results and clinical failures when, ice, when uh, hip dysplasia is treated with isolated hip arthroscopy. These are the trends of patients treated by the anchor study group. So these are patients that are treated with periacetabular osteotomy over time, and in the light blue, you can see the percentage of patients over time that have a failed hip arthroscopy prior to their periacetabular osteotomy. So that you see over time, we're seeing more and more patients that have, have had a failed arthroscopy and need to go on to the periacetabular osteotomy. So a natural question is, well, what is the impact of that failed arthroscopy and the outcome of our periacetabular osteotomy, or the salvage periacetabular osteotomy. So our purpose here is to determine the, the patient-reported outcomes of the PAO in treating symptomatic acetabular dysplasia in patients that have failed arthroscopic treatment, and then compare these PROs to a matched cohort undergoing PAO without previous surgery. In terms of the methods, we looked at our anchor prospective multicenter cohort. This cohort is now over 2,000 cases. For this study, we looked at the first 971 PAOs to look at patients that have had, had previous failed arthroscopy. And we looked at patients at a minimum one-year follow-up. So we started with 971 patients. Exclusion criteria are here listed on the slide. And after uh, screening the patients, we have 52 patients who underwent PAO for symptomatic acetabular dysplasia after a failed arthroscopy. We compared those patients to a matched group of 115 hips in patients that underwent PAO without previous uh, hip arthroscopy. And they were, made, a, they were matched by age, sex, BMI, and lateral center of jangle. We looked at patient reported outcome metrics uh, for this talk, the Harris HIP score, UCLA score, and the SS12 physical function score. Uh, these are the mat matched groups, so you can see age is basically the same, BMI basically the same. 90, about 94% of the patients are female in both groups. Lateral center of jangle, on average, about 15. So these are truly dysplastic hips. These aren't um, uh, largely borderline hips. Um, similarly, the index uh, 15.8 and 17.3 in those that had not had previous surgery. When we look at the severity of dysplasia, similar when we break it down into borderline mild and moderate or severe in both groups. In terms of additional treatments, so at the time of the, P of the PAO, hip arthroscopy was performed in just over 30% of the patients in both groups. So those that had had a previous hip arthroscopy and those that had not. In terms of intraarticular work, labral repair was done uh, more commonly in those that had had previous scope, as was labral debridement and acetabular chondroplasty. In terms of our results, if we look at the patients preoperatively, they had a lower modified Harris HIP score at the time of presentation, so more pain and more dysfunction. They had lower UCLA activity scores, and they had lower physical function scores as well. 
at follow-up, <clears throat> previous hip arthroscopy was associated with lower, lower Harris hip score, so about nine points, which is uh, clinically important. Also lower SF12 and lower UCLA activity scores. These are the Harris hip score uh, changes over time. You can see the delta in the two groups is about the same at 22 points, but the previous scope group presents with lower scores and they end with lower scores, again with a similar delta. <clears throat> when we look at excellent outcomes, so those patients that have a Harris hip score of 90 or above, those with a previous hip arthroscopy, only 30% of those patients realized an excellent clinical result compared to over 50% of the patients that had not had previous hip arthroscopy. Limitations of the study are significant, so we don't have the success rate of all hip arthroscopy procedures that are being done. We're just looking at a subgroup that have failed hip arthroscopy. Uh, the intraarticular disease staging is incomplete because only about 30% of the patients had uh, combined arthroscopy at the time of the PAO. And we really, we, we are unable to control for all the potential con confounding factors in these two different groups. If we look at the literature, really not much literature, uh, a case report, uh, a, a small series from Boston that did not show a difference between these two different uh, groups, although that was a relatively uh, understudied, underpowered study. And then a recent study from HSS from Ernie Sink and his group showing very similar results to ours in that uh, the, the patients that had a previous hip arthroscopy did not get optimal uh, hip outcomes when compared to, to patients that had not had previous hip arthroscopy. So in conclusion, patients with uh, acetabular dysplasia and failed previous hip arthroscopy, they do demonstrate clinically important improvements in terms of pain relief, function, and activity. But when we compare them to the match group, uh, these improvements are blunted and they present with lower scores and they end up with lower scores, and, and their final HIP scores are clinically important differences. We obviously need longer-term follow-up on larger patient populations to better answer this uh, clinical question. These data do suggest, though, that patients that have had previous arthroscopy and are undergoing the PAO may have um, um, suboptimal outcomes relative to that operation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.